Okay, so welcome all to Wine and Wisdom for this week, Parsha Teha This week, we read the Parsha Teha and the, 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 the tonight's lesson is titled, Embrace Your Mistakes, How the Reality of Sin is All Part of the Master Plan. Um, as always, before we get started with our lesson, um, of course, we always start with the Lachayim, we made a bracha before. But, but we also like to get started by at least doing a brief overview of the Parsha. Okay? So the word Behalotcha means to make rise. And the reason for this is because the first part of this week's Torah portion speaks about the kindling of the menorah and the commandment to Aaron to do so. And that from then on, it should be the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, should always kindle the menorah. Um, and uh, Behalotcha means that, the, that, that, that when they would light the menorah, Aaron would have to stay there with the wick. For the women on the class, I'm sure you, you're familiar with this, when you light your Shabbos candles, even for the men, when you light anything, you have to kind of hold the, the, the flame right until it kind of goes up on its own, until it gets a life of its own. So the Torah tells us, when you make the flame rise, uh, this teaches us that, that Aaron has to make the flame rise on its own. By the way, and I don't want to spend the whole partial overview giving lessons for each one, but this one is a very powerful takeaway um, one of the most famous takeaways from this is that whenever you inspire another Jew, it should never be kind of a touch and go inspiration. It should always be um, that you make the person live on their own. You can't inspire someone, but then the moment that you leave, the fire doesn't remain with them. You have to kind of inspire other people in a way that, that there's something left within them that they can inspire themselves. I guess similar to teaching man to fish, I guess the spiritual version. Right. In any event. Uh, we continue with the second Passover, and I will not get too much into that because, we, first of all, because we're going to talk about it a little bit in today's parsha in, in today's lesson, uh, but also because most of you are familiar with this, when we had uh, a lesson, uh, we skipped the parsha that week, and we spoke mainly about Pesach Shein, the second Passover, we spoke all about this. Um, so this week's Torah portion, we also get uh, a little glimpse into the complaining that the Jewish people do as part of, as part of their journey through right, the 40 years in the desert. There is the problem with the, with the manna from head, and the, for, sorry, the manna or bread from heaven uh, when they want meat, that business. Um, okay. Uh, and then at the end of the parsha, we have Lashon Hara. We have uh, a, a, an instance where the, the leaders of the Jewish people um, fall prey to, to Lashon Hara. Uh, there's lots of discussion about why we shouldn't judge them for that. Um, Miriam and, and Aaron are talking to each other about why Moses thinks he's so, he's so holy, why is he holy to them? They all have God speak to them, and what is the difference? And as a result, they are stripping of leprosy, and uh, or, or Miriam is, 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 uh, is uh, punished with leprosy, and then Moses prays for her healing. The entire community waits seven days for her to recover until they continue traveling. That's at the end, at the very tail end of this week's, this week's story. Portion. But today, as was noted in the, in, the, in the lesson title, we'd like to talk about embracing your mistakes. Right? Or, 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 or embracing the idea of sin. Now, what do we mean by that? We don't mean getting comfortable with the idea of sin, heaven forbid. But let me open with a question. For those of you that follow me on Facebook, you've probably seen a little bit of the, a little bit of the conversation around this. There are two famous uh, concepts of Judaism, uh, and they're, they're actually precepts of our belief, they're principles, bedrocks of our belief. And number one is that we, we all believe that we have freedom of choice. And number two, right, because if we don't have freedom of choice, what are we doing with all these mitzvahs? And number two is we all believe that God is omnipotent and God runs the whole world and God kind of oversees everything. Um, and the, don't, don't worry if you're not fully on board with these two ideas. We're going to talk about them in just a moment. But then at the very end of the lesson, we're going to try to get on board with how do we bridge these two together? In other words, how do these two ideas work in tandem? How can we at the same time say we have freedom of choice, yet at the same time God controls the world? If God controls everything that goes on, so then if I one day don't wake up from Indian, isn't he the one who made me sleep through my alarm clock? Not that this is a practical example. I never sleep through my alarm clock, but just in case I had, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> in that <in> event. <laughs> so the, uh, the, the episode of this week's Torah portion that we're going to kind of use as a springboard for this discussion is the episode about the second Passover. Okay, so let me just refresh your memories really quickly, or uh, uh, at least let Marilyn refresh, refresh your memories really quickly. In this week's Torah portion, we learned for the first time about a second chance. Marilyn, when you're ready. 
There were men who were ritually unclean because of contact with the dead person and therefore could not make the Passover sacrifice on that day. So they approached Moses and Aaron on that day. Those men said to him, we are ritually unclean because of contact with the dead person. But why should we be excluded so as not to bring the offering of God in its appointed time with all the children of Israel? Moses said to them, wait, and I will hear what the Lord. Sorry, hold on. Instructs. You see that right there? Uh, instructs, instructs concerning, concerning you. you. Right. And then keep, uh, keep us going, uh, Marilyn. We all know what happens. Text 1b, Moses finally talks to, uh, meaning God finally responds to Moses. And what does he say? God spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying any person who becomes unclean from contact with the dead or is on a distant journey, whether among you or in future generations, he shall make a Passover sacrifice for God. In the second month on the 14th day in the afternoon, they shall make it. They shall eat it with unleavened cakes and bitter herbs. They shall not leave over anything from it until the next morning. And they shall not break any of its bones. They shall make it in accordance with all the statutes connected with the Passover sacrifice. Thank you, Marilyn. So many of you are familiar with this holiday. We spoke about it when the holiday came on the calendar. It's exactly one month after Passover. So um, actually pretty much around almost exactly a month to the day from today. In other words, a month ago from today. Um, and from this was born, this new Jewish holiday that till today we celebrate, not majorly, at least we eat matzah, and we uh, don't say kacharon, you know. It's a joyous day. It's supposed to be a joyous day. Um, but more importantly, perhaps, from here we get this great concept called second chances, right? We learn that we should never be satisfied just because we don't get an opportunity to do something in our youth, or maybe you didn't grow up uh, keeping Torah mitzvahs, so then when you're older, you can still do it. If you had a, if, if maybe had a slip-up when you were younger, then when you're older, you can take care of it. Whatever it is, right? Or even if it's not even younger and older, even if it's in the same day, right? Even if we make a mistake, we can always make up for it. But here's the interesting part. This is where we're going to go today. This would imply, you know, if somebody makes a mistake, so then, sure, they should be allowed to correct it. But what if somebody doesn't make a mistake? What if they sin purposefully? Okay? Arnold, you want to read for us? Okay. This, um, one second. This, um, this mitzvah is codified, as all mitzvahs are, in, by Maimonides. But here he points out an interesting thing. Go ahead, Arnold. If someone deliberately did not offer the initial partial uh, uh, Paschal lamb, he is to offer the second time, uh, to offer it the second time, one. Hmm. One second. Did anybody notice the same word I noticed? Anybody? Deliberately. Deliberately. In other words, Pesach came and he said, I'm not in the mood of Pesach. <laughs> Comes Pesach Sheini. Um, and you see, he is in the mood. And the Torah says, sure, go ahead. You, you changed your mind, go ahead. I don't get it. When it was a holiday supposed to be all about second chances, they couldn't because they were forced because they were carrying Joseph's bones. And even till today, if somebody has some sort of situation, somebody passes away, so they're impure, they're sitting shit for their parents, they can't bring Pesach. All right, I get it. This makes perfect sense to me. This is very Jewish. Teshuva, you should be able to come back and you should be able to, 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 to make a new Pesach. But this fella, deliberately chose not to offer the initial Pesach lamb, and he's always to offer the second one? Or as the rabbi puts it in a yom yom, making this more relevant for today, Arnold, text three. The theme of Pesach Sheni is that it is never too late. It is always possible to put things right, even if one was, was ritually impure or one was far away. And even in case of a, a lechem, uh, of lechem for, for you, that is, uh, when the impurity was deliberate, Nonetheless, he can correct it. Ooh, so a person can always do teshuva no matter what? This seems like a very, very strong statement. In fact, we always say a person can do teshuva no matter what. Then we say the gates of teshuva are never closed. They say anybody can, anybody can always do teshuva, etc., right? Right. But the, the Talmud seems to have one very strong caveat to that. Um, and that is... Precisely this instance. If someone not only does it deliberately, but has in mind to do teshuva. Come and you want to read for us? This is from the Mishnah in Tractate Yuma, 
chapter 8, uh, Halacha 9, or Mishnah 9. One who says, I shall sin and repent, sin and repent, they do not afford him the opportunity to repent. If one says, I shall sin and Yom Kippur will atone for me, Yom Kippur does not affect atonement. So it turns out that while we always say Teshuvah is limitless and a person can always have a second chance, it's not really so. There is one exception. If a person, as he is sinning, is having in mind to, to, to do teshuva, then Hashem said, well, then the Talmud says his teshuva is not accepted. And actually, the Talmud has a very interesting phrase for this um, because it turns out that there's this concept of a prosecutor and a defender. So think of every time we do an action as a little angel being, being created, right? So if we do something positive, right, let's say we they would they a classic example, like help an old lady cross the street, or it could be something a little bit more mystical, whatever, you know, I, I'm at home and I meditate and I connect to Hashem through davening, whatever it is. Whenever we do a positive action, we create a little, right, let's, 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 let's use something very visual. There's a little angel that flies up above that kind of defends us, stands to our rescue. When it comes time for us to be judged, whatever that is, whether that's during our lifetime or after our lifetime, right, the world to come, either way, that angel stands up and says, hey, so she is a good person. So she once helped an old lady cross the street. And hopefully I have thousands of those angels. And even if I have a couple of the other angels, so then they, right? When we do a negative action, it's the opposite. Those angels are the prosecutors. They stand up and they say, no, don't you dare. Says the Talmud, and we're not going to quote this one inside, but I'll share it with you. A, a prosecutor can never become a, a, a defender. Right? So what happens here? What happens here? When a person says, when a person says, I will sin, and then I'm going to do Teshuvah later, inherently what he did is he took Teshuvah and he made it a prosecutor. He took the very idea of repentance and he made it a prosecutor. Why? Because what is it? What, what purpose is his Teshuvah, his repentance serving now? It's allowing him to sin, mm -hmm. right? In other words, we all have things that allow us to sin. Usually it's the stories we tell ourselves. We say, I'm still a good guy, even though I'm doing this, or a good gal. Right? I don't want to be sexist there. Women can also sin. <laughs> right? so, so in other words, we, we tell ourselves these little stories, whatever it is, to tell ourselves that we can do this Aveda or this transgress the will of Hashem in this moment. In this instance that the Talmud is bringing up, what's going on here? The, the, the fellow, right, this individual is telling himself, I can sin because I'm going to do Teshuva later, so don't worry about it. So in other words, he's made the Teshuva, he's made the repentance a part of him sinning. And now you want that that prosecutor should come later and defend you? It doesn't work that way. They only get to choose one. As the Alter Rebbe clarifies for us in Tanya, Kalman, you were middle reading for us, right? Mm -hmm. It's that uh, deliberate in, action that is the problem. Uh, it's not just the deliberate, it's the deliberate and the having in mind that I'm going to do Teshuva later. Right. So right. That's, what, that's kind of his backup plan that allows him to sin. Right. Right? Kalman, go ahead. Let, let's see this in the words of the Alter Rebbe. Inasmuch as it is the repentance itself that caused him to sin, it is thus not afforded to him afterward. Okay, because that's what's, that's what's helping him sin. How can it afterwards help, help him defend you? Normally, teshuva is this higher level. When I was one person, I sinned. Teshuva helps me become a new person. I turn over a new leaf. I'm no longer that person who sinned. I'm now a new person. So teshuva helps us be a new person. Teshuva comes to our rescue. But if you, when you were sinning, were using Teshuvah to help you sin, it doesn't work. Share with you a story. You know, uh, I know this story very well because um, I was a, a staff member for four summers when I was single at the same summer camp. An overnight camp, Morristown, New Jersey. It was called Yeshiva Summer Program. And the director was a fellow whose name, and, and, oh, so crucial to understand is that this was a, a, a summer program only for eighth graders. So every year was a fresh batch of kids. It wasn't like there were seventh graders who were in the seventh grade program, another in the eighth grade program. It was always the same age kids. So we were actually able to share the same things and say the same things every single year. So the director of the camp would get up every single year at the banquet and he would always share the same speech, exactly the same speech word for word. And it was only a couple of staff that would know that because all of the kids would be fresh because it's exactly the same age. So they, there was no second year students or, or second year campers. Anyways, what was his speech? His speech was very powerful. He would stand up at the banquet, so this is after two months, two and a half months of being at summer camp, and he would say, Shalom Aleichem. I want to say Shalom Aleichem to all of you. I want to say greetings, welcome to all of you. 
They would look around the room and everybody would be puzzled, right? Why are you saying welcome to us? Why are you saying shalom aleichem? We were here for two months. You should be saying goodbye. The whole purpose of this banquet is to say goodbye to us. So he would say, I see that you're all puzzled. So he would say, I'd like to share with you a story of the rabbi. This is the following story that he would share. And then I'll, I'll explain why he would say shalom aleichem. So he would say, there was once a chassid who left on a trip, left his house from Crown Heights, and he was going on a trip. He was heading out to the airport. And so in the early, early years, the Rebbe was much more accessible. But there weren't as many mm-hmm. there wasn't that, there weren't as many people. And he was heading out on this trip, and he realized that he forgot something at home. I don't know what it was. A pair of shoes, I don't know. Diet, I don't know. I don't know. Probably something important. Now, many of you may be familiar that there's a book called Sabat of Yehuda Chassid, which means it's, a, uh, it's the, uh, the, the will and testament of Rabbi Yehuda Chassid by an ancient rabbi. And it has kind of all these customs that many Jews follow till today. Don't cut your, uh, uh, don't, uh, what's he say? Whatever, all sorts of things. I'm trying to think of some other ones besides the one I'm going to share. One of the things that he shares with us is that once you start out on a trip, you shouldn't go back. You shouldn't go back to the place where you started. If you started out on your trip, finish your trip and then come home. You shouldn't go back home to, to do something and then, cut that, then, and then leave on the trip. He says because it's a bad omen, whatever. So this chassid writes it to the rabbi. So, so he decides, look, I'm on my way on this trip, and I have to figure out if I should go back, and I don't know what to do. So he pops by 770's department, and he pops by the rabbi's office. Turns out the rabbi was there. The, secretar- the secretary's let him in, and he goes and he asks the rabbi, what should I do? Maybe he wrote it. I don't remember the details. So the rabbi tells him, so in other words, he's asking him, you know, do I have to be so careful? There's a reason for me to go back. This is like something that we're actually careful about. It's not a lacha. It's not Jewish law. It's just kind of a custom. It's been passed down throughout the years. So the rabbi told him, um, listen, you should go. Go back. Go get whatever you need. You're worried that you're, that, that about this sabbat, so you're not supposed to go, leave and come back and go again, that it might have some sort of harm on you. He says, here's a solution. When you go into the house, say a chapter of Tanya, learn a chapter of Tanya properly, and then come out. So it says, in this manner, the first person who traveled on the journey was one person. But then when you study the chapter of Tanya, hopefully you took it to heart and you'll have done Teshuv and you'll become a new person. So now the person who leaves the house is a new person. Spiritually wow. speaking, it's a brand new person leaving the house. So no bad omens could ever affect you. Brilliant, wow. no? Very, very interesting. Yeah. So, so truthfully, if we learn Tanya properly, and by the way, if you note, we are the, the section of Tanya that we're in the middle of quoting in text 5a and comes to read to us in a moment, text 5b, um, you'll notice that it's not the first part of Tanya, which is the more famous part, not even the second part of Tanya, which is the philosophical part, but the third part of Tanya, which is what we get at Teshuvah, which is where the Altarebbe discusses Teshuvah specifically. The Altarebbe discusses it, that what happens when a person goes to Teshuvah is they become a new person. Oh, by, by the way, just to finish a story with the director, so he would say to them, you know, over the past two months of this summer, you've learned so much Torah, you've grown so much, so now you must be completely fresh people. So now I'm saying to you, Shalom Aleichem, I'm saying welcome, even though it's at the end. It was, a, it was a, I, by the way, I see why he used the same speech every year. It was a good line. It's a good way. It's a good opening. And, and then, of course, he would share whatever he shared, you know, why yeah. he thought that someone was special, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the event, so the author shares with us that that's why the mechanism doesn't work. From a technical perspective, why can't the person say, I will do teshuva? And that's why I can sit now. Because he's already violating, he's voiding the, the defender that he's going to have later. It's becoming his prosecutor. It's becoming part of the process for negativity. But says the Alter Rebbe in text 5b that even so, technically, you can still get it to work. Helmut. Even in this situation of one who says, I shall sin and repent, he is not afforded an opportunity. But if he pushes and overwhelms his impulses and repents, it is accepted. Says the Alter Rebbe, it's true. Someone who, who says, I'm going to sin and then I'm going to repent, they don't give him the opportunity to do Teshuvah. Look at text 4. That's from the Talmud, right? That's the origin of this statement. It says, uh, uh, they will not afford him, I guess from above, the opportunity to, to, to repent. Says the Alter Rebbe. In other words, this means Teshuvah is still possible. It's just that they will make it accessible for you. It's not going to be an easy process. There's like this higher level, this higher version of Teshuvah that he can get in tune with that he will be able to do. Okay? Um, we're going to skip text 6, which is kind of the optional section where they get into the details of it. They explain exactly what that higher level is. But for time's sake, we're going to move on to the, okay, now that we have our springboard and we understand how this whole second chances thing, thing works, right? So now let's get to the philosophical part, right? So what I'd like to do with you now in the next two, three texts is as follows. 
We're going to quote from a couple of different places. We're going to quote from Maimonides. We're going to quote from the Seder, a couple of places. And I'm going to attempt to bring you both scriptural proof and logical proof on both sides. Okay? On both sides of the, the, the paradox that we have here, the paradox of free choice and the master plan. Free choice being afforded to every single human being and the master plan that God, that God has. And then hopefully after that, we'll actually provide a proper answer, or at least to some degree, some sort of clarity on this, on this idea. Okay? So, Shlomo, why don't you get us started by reading from the Rambam, where he starts, to, where, this is in the Rambam, by the way, also the laws of the Shuba, and where he discusses the idea of freedom of choice, right? Because let's start off on a very dumb level. Do we have freedom of choice? Maybe not. Maybe we're just a whole bunch of robots in a, in a mundane, in, in, not a mundane, in, a, in an illusion, one big illusion of a world, and we're just going about our thing. Fischl likes this idea. I see him nodding his head. I saw that coming. Of course, Fischl's going to buy into this. He's like, it's a great conspiracy theory. <laughs> He's like, my middle name is conspiracy theories. <laughs> so Shlomo, this is from Maimonides, where Maimonides is discussing why it's impossible for the Jewish belief to say that we don't have freedom of choice. It must be that we have freedom of choice. <clears throat> this principle is a fundamental concept and a pillar on which rests the tight totality of the Torah and mitzvahs. Uh, as the verse states, behold, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Similarly, it is stated, behold, I have set before you today the blessing and the curse, implying that the choice is in your hands. Any one of the deeds of men which a person desires to do, he may do whether good or evil. Therefore, the verse states, if only their hearts would always remain this way. From this, we can infer that the Creator does not compel or decree that people should do either good or bad. Rather, everything is left to their own choice. So, Bechira. That's right. Thank you, Shlomo. So that's some pretty deep stuff. But you can see some scriptural references there. Does everybody see that? Right? right. It turns out the Torah tells us we have freedom of choice. Right? Hashem tells us, see, I have seen before you, I have laid before you today the, the good which is life and the, the bad which is death, and choose life. The Torah tells us to choose life as if we have some kind of choice. But, but let's not rely just on scriptural proof here. What about logically? Logically, the Torah is full of references as is our belief system in general, our, the principles of the bedrocks of our belief are full of references to reward and punishment, right? That we get rewarded if we do something good and we, and, 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 and we are punished if we do something negative, right? I don't get it. How can you punish me for doing something bad if I never really had a choice to begin with? This seems to be very clear um, lo uh, logical proof, at least if we believe in reward and punishment. I guess you could also not believe in that. But if you believe in that, then you, then, thank you, Gideon. This is so beautiful. It's one of my favorite moments in the Torah. It's not a story or anything, but that that choice. When my daughter was bat mitzvah, this is what I mm -hmm. said to her on the bima. This, yes, I, I completely get it. This is a very powerful statement that Hashem makes. And by the way, without these statements and without the logical proof of like the fact that the Torah tells us there is a reward and punishment, Fischl might be right. Maybe there is no choice. Maybe we're just a whole bunch of robots doing our thing, right? Um, but it turns out that Torah tells us clearly that there is such a thing as choice, that we should choose the right thing to do. But we have a problem, right? We have a problem, right? There's the other side of the coin, which is divine providence. We also believe that God is complete, completely omnipotent. So we believe in one God, and one God means we believe that nobody else, nothing, no other being in this world has any control over anything but God. In other words, God is the one who decides what happens. So let's start with the scriptural references. Okay? Um, who was reading for us? Uh, Shlomo was just reading for us. So Stephanie, why don't you go ahead? I believe with perfect faith that Hashem is aware of all human thoughts and actions. As it is stated, he who forms their hearts together who understand all their deeds. So, thank you, Stephanie. This is a, um, this is, okay. Let's start with the fact that this is one of the 13 principles of faith uh, uh, by Maimonides. 
uh, uh, laid down by Maimonides, the 13 bedrocks of Abedish. Um But the reason why they're quoting it as Siddur and not as Maimonides is because, contrary to, I don't know, popular belief, but definitely many people make this mistake, um, my, my Maimonides did not compose the 13 Animamins. So the 13 Animamins, which is what many people say in the Siddur, or some, some people say it even every day after davening, um, some people only on Shabbat, etc. Those 13 Animamins, which means it's like a poetic way of putting on the 13 principles of faith, those were not composed by Maimonides. Maimonides kind of laid down the 13 principles, and then uh, there was someone else who composed it. I, I, I believe there's even, uh, like, we're not even sure exactly. It's just kind of a, a poetic version of it. Uh, but the point is the same. I believe with perfect faith that Hashem is aware of all thought and action. And then look at the scriptural reference. Why? Because he who forms their hearts together. In other words, Hashem makes our emotions happen and he understands everything that we do. Wow. That's quite a, that's quite a statement. But that's scriptural proof. And that's scriptural proof to the fact that Hashem is aware and is in control of everything. But really, there's logical proof to it as well. Let's start from the very, very first fundamental Jewish belief, which is, I believe, that there's one God. That's it. I mean, the, the bedrock of Jewish belief is the, 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 the foundation of it all, where it all starts from, is Anochi Hashem Lekechem, the first of the Ten Commandments. We believe in one God, monotheism, right? Abraham, oh, we say always, Abraham was the father of monotheism. He walked around and he told everybody there's only one God. There were many people who believed in other things. They believed in idolatry. They believed in, in uh, what's the word, poly? Polytheism? Is that the right word? Yes. Yeah. They believe in polytheism. Some of them believe in the sun and the moon and the stars. There's this whole galaxy. There's the God of the sun, the God of the moon, the God of the earth, the God of the, of the, of the seas, right? I mean, for those of you that studied uh, Greco Roman uh, or, or, or Greek philosophy and these sort of kind of things, you're very familiar with these things, right? Or really, if you've watched almost any movie in Hollywood, they almost all reference one or two of them, right? Um, and the, the, God, the gods had to be appeased. They. They were they were cruel, and okay, so okay. But I, I I want to focus on a different point. I want to focus on a different point. So what was the big deal when we said monotheism? Monotheism meant we believe that there's one God, and that had that had a very very big impact on the world because believing that there's one God also means you can now trust Him. For instance, for those of you that are in the faith and trust class that happens every Monday, you're familiar that this is a big this is a big foundation to that. Believing in one God means you can all of a sudden not believe in. Uh, in, uh, you, you, you don't have to believe anymore that the world runs by chance because there's one God that runs everything. And there's no other God or no other being, not a lower God or a higher God or another being or, or a trinity of any sort, right? That's also denounced in Judaism that, that somehow is involved in his decision. So included in that is that also human beings are not gods. Also human beings cannot be involved in his decision and decide, you know, What's going to happen? So there's also logical proof to the fact that Hashem makes everything happen. So we got a problem. We got a problem. Is Hashem in control of everything? Or do I, do I get to choose between good and evil and I, whatever I choose, that's what Hashem does. And if, and if I don't choose, then how can Hashem punish me or reward me? Right? So before we move on, it's important, extremely important. It's important for me to make a major uh, disclaimer. This is beyond this. This topic is beyond the scope of tonight's lesson. We're going to tackle it, but we're going to tackle it from one specific angle, one specific answer. While there really are many answers, and it's been it's been discussed by many Jewish philosophers. Uh, if anybody needs any references, I'm happy to reference some places where this is discussed, including, by the way, as recently as the Rebbe. But even prior to that, there's the Kuzari, it's a famous philosophical work in the Mor and the Vuchim. The Rambam discusses this in the Shmona Prakim, by the way, uh, which is another uh, author, uh, another another uh, uh, piece of uh, another work by the by the uh, by the Rambam by Maimonides. So he discusses this at length as well. Today we're going to do a limited explanation, only what's specific to what we want to focus on today, and we're going to kind of move on from that. So I, if you don't have a full understanding of this, if you want to, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to recommend some books. These books are all translated into English. Um, or if it doesn't bother you as much, or, you, or you're happy to have the conversation and to have it be something you grow with completely, I don't know that I always fully understand this 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 idea, but um, it's something that I'm it's part of it, part, it's part of my Judaism that I'm always growing with. But for today, we'd like to focus by making a differentiation between freedom of choice and freedom of action. Okay. 
let me give an example. Let's start with an example. On Facebook, when I, when I, when I asked this question, so somebody suggested, uh, Shlomo, do you remember the text of my question? I don't remember the text. Shlomo, you were on Facebook. You were part of that conversation. What was the text of the, of the question? Are you there, Shlomo? We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Let me check okay. it. Yeah, go ahead if you can. You'll probably get it quicker than I will. Let's see. Hold on. Uh, I have it. I have it too. You have yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. And, go ahead, Shlomo. Asking Shlomo, ahead. for a friend. He said, if I sin, does that mean I've altered God's master plan? So I guess somebody took this as meaning that I must have done something that I'm looking for. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that you had stuff. a French fry from McDonald's. Exactly. Right. So there was yeah, a discussion yeah, yeah. about, they were like, oh, Rabbi Sushi, did you start eating from McDonald's? What happened? So let's take that as an example, okay? Let's say I choose, with my freedom of choice, to go to McDonald's and to eat something free. Not even a French fry, a French fry, whatever, you know. There's no French fry, it's just a potato, right? It's true that it wasn't cooked the right thing and it might add taste. Other non kosher things, right? But let's say I sit down and I have a, 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 a happy burger, what do you call it? A, a Big Mac, a Big Mac, right? A burger with cheese. The burger is not kosher and there's milk and meat. It's everything wrong. Let's say I choose to do that, right? Does this mean that I also did it? Not necessarily. Sometimes I can choose to do that. For instance, if I would have chosen a month and a half ago or two months, three months ago to do that, all the McDonald's would have been closed. I may have had freedom of choice but I don't have freedom of action. Doing the action is a combination of many different factors that are happening in this world. Many of them, or all of them, which are controlled by Hashem, right? So there is freedom of choice, but it's also freedom of opportunity or freedom of action. You actually doing it. There's the fact that I make a choice to do something good or bad, and then there's the fact that I actually do it. <clears throat> so Hashem allows us that freedom of choice but he controls the freedom of action, whether it actually comes into fruition. You know, you know, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions, but here we're saying the exact opposite. Marilyn asks me for help, and I say, yes, Marilyn, I'm gonna make the choice, I'm gonna help you, da 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 Turns out she needs whatever, a million dollars. I don't have a million dollars. But I already made that choice to do a good thing. Says Hashem, you made the choice, the opportunity is a different discussion. Right? The, the action itself is a different discussion. For instance, let's see text nine. Uh, we'll be holding here. Um, Stephanie, I think. Right? Was Stephanie just read for us. Fischl, why don't you read for us a little bit? Text nine. Okay, text nine. Uh, I will handle, I will make home. Uh, no. If huh? one sets. Hold on. Yeah. If one sits and does not transgress, he, re he receives a reward as one who performs a mitzvah, despite the fact that he does not actually perform a mitzvah. Wow, okay. So this is a powerful thing. Yeah. Right? And has, this, has this ever occurred to anybody? You know, there are 613 mitzvahs, famously, right? right. There yeah. are 365 negative ones, 248 positive ones. So it's pretty clear how you fulfill a positive one, right? If you put on tefillin, you fulfill the mitzvah, you tefillin, you eat kosher. Oh, there's no, there's no mitzvah to eat kosher. There's a, there's a mitzvah to, eat, to, to not eat non-kosher. Okay, well, let's say I make kiddush on Shabbos, I fulfill the mitzvah of kiddush. I like Shabbos, I fulfill the mitzvah of Shabbos. It's great. But what about the negative commandments, right? It says do not murder, right? Shlomo, yeah. do, you do you think I deserve a big round of applause because I haven't murdered anybody today? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. Meaning, I don't get it. How do I fulfill do not murder? Certainly, I fulfill it by not murdering all my life. So this Gemara says, this Talmud lays down, that every moment that you're sitting, you don't do a mitzvah, and sorry, and you don't do an Avera, you don't, do, you don't transgress the will of Hashem, whichever one of those 365 it is, whether it's not eating treif, or whether it's uh, uh, right, right, not, not, not eating non-kosher, or whether it's not murdering someone, not stealing, whatever it is, you have at that moment done a mitzvah. Wow. Do you know how many mitzvahs we've done over the past 20 minutes in this class? Besides the fact that everybody here is studying Torah, we got out here 10 people, 9 people, 9 people times 365 for every minute that we've been sitting, we've been doing another mitzvah. 
So as soon as a person stops eating at I don't get it. Why is Mashiach not here yet? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Look how many mitzvahs can go to McDonald's and eat and then finish, and then as soon as he steps outside, he's doing a mitzvah because he's not eating the treif anymore. I know how amazing is that, huh? <laughs> so a person doesn't have to keep kosher and he could be keeping kosher. Well, no, well, that's not true. The po- I, I, I think I think, I think you're making a very, very valid point. I think you're making a very, very valid point. Many people, unfortunately, look at themselves and they say, I'm a treif yet. I'm a Jew who doesn't keep kosher. But well, that's not true. But that's not true. Just because yesterday you didn't keep kosher doesn't mean today you don't. Every Jew who once didn't keep kosher and now keeps kosher, at some point in between, there was a day when he said, yesterday I, I, I didn't eat kosher and today I ate, I ate kosher. Mm-hmm. Right? So even if a person, this is precise, but Shlomo, you're starting to touch on what the Alter Rebbe introduces, what a benoni is. Every moment is a struggle for him. In this moment, he's not eating kosher, but again, he has to wrestle with himself about this, this issue which should I eat kosher or should I eat not kosher? So could you say the, the pickle on a Big Mac is kosher? <clears throat> so therefore the pic- it's kosher? Yeah. kosher? Absolutely. The pickle itself is kosher. Unless, unless it touched the Big Mac, in which case there's something inside it that might have gone in. Not by mm-hmm. not. You know these terms, Shlomo, a little bit, right? Yeah, I guess so. The smicha terms? <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. But then where does, where does the issue of uh, choice come in? Because... One I, second. We're, we're not... A, we're not all in the issue of choice. Slow down. Don't worry. We're going to get there, Arnold. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. Don't worry. Okay. So the Zohar goes even further. The, so- the Zohar says that it's not just that when a person is not sinning, they're actually doing a mitzvah. When a person is not sinning, they're actually causing a tremendous, tremendous amount of joy to God. Uh, official, you were in the middle of reading for us, right? Go ahead. Okay. Right. Let us see. The Zohar. the Zohar extols the great pleasure God gets when we subdue all negative impulses down here on earth. When we do so, God's glory rises above all, more than any, uh, any praise to ever greater heights. So whenever we do a negative commandment, and what does that mean we do a negative commandment? It means that we sit, we don't do it. Every moment that I don't do it. But let me explain the logic behind it. Remember what we said? We said... Um, how, does a, how does it work? How does it work? You have freedom of choice. You don't necessarily have freedom of action. So when I choose to not do a negative commandment, when I choose not to disobey the will of Hashem, says the Torah, then in that moment, I cause a tremendous amount of, of nachas Hashem. Why? This has nothing to do with the fact of whether I actually do the negative thing or not. That might be Hashem. In this moment, right, why do I get, why do I get any sort of uh, uh, benefit, any, any sort of, excuse me, credit or mitzvah for not doing a negative commandment? I don't get it. All I did was sit here. I've been sitting here, like most of you have been sitting here, and it's pretty rude to walk away from the, from the camera right now. I'm in the middle of talking, but I'm giving me a class. You came to attend the class, right? But, but, but in being just a mensch by sitting here and not being rude, even if you're not listening to me, right, you're automatically <laughs> doing a mitzvah because you're not doing a negative commandment. Why does that credit count? That credit counts for a very simple reason. Because the opportunity, the action, that depends on Hashem. The fact that McDonald's is not open, or the fact that I don't happen to have a Big Mac right here in front of me and I'm not eating it, that's Hashem's choice. That's Hashem running the world. But the fact that I'm sitting right now and I'm making a decision not to eat a Big Mac, like Shlomo says, in this moment, I'm a tzaddik. In this moment, I'm doing an amazing thing. Not only is the Talmud considering it like a did a mitzvah, but the Zara is saying I'm causing a tremendous, like a rush for God. Right? So, so to summarize, you threw away that box of incense, right? Remember? Come again? Oops, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking to me. Sorry. I thought That's my kids were talking to me. No worries. You're good. You're good. So, God grants us choice, um, which is a plan that puts us at a crossroads between right and wrong. In other words, he puts us, he gives us this path, and he puts us constantly choosing between right and wrong. And it's designed for us to select what's right. Yeah? But he left unsaid, right, in all of this, a pertinent point, which is that just as we have the option to make the right choice that Hashem wants to make, we're also capable of, capable of making the wrong choice. And when we make the choice, right, something terrible happens. We transgress the will of Hashem. 
But back to our million dollar question, when we do that, one second, did we mess up the plan? Did we, did God have a plan to do something and now it's a failure because we chose not to do it? By the way, we keep asking these questions about us and I don't know that anybody ever really thinks about it that often when it comes to us. It's very, very hard as human beings to think, oh, I'm gonna drink this drink, which actually is mainly made up of uh, fruits and whatever, but uh, there's a drop of uh, gelatin in it from a pig. Right? It's like a little bit of the fat of a pig. It's mixed in there. And I literally take, I, I, I change it. But think about it with Adam Arishon, if, if you need some context. Right? The first man. Hashem had a plan for the world. That plan was for it to be in the Garden of Eden. Adam came and ate from the tree of knowledge. Right? And because of that sin, the whole world went askew. Every, like almost he changed the whole plan up. And Hashem had to redesign the whole thing from scratch. Is that what happened? Or was this originally part of God's plan? Which, which we, how, how does this go? It was part of God's brings, plan because all of the potential was there. And this brings us, you, you, what, you, what you're saying is very, very valid, Arnold. And uh, it's going to be a part of our conversation. Now. God this three. brings us to section three. God's 3D chess. I love, I love the title. Of it. I love the, the, the <laughs> subcaption. Of it. I don't know who came up with it. But it's cute. It's cute. Very cute. Right? Taking a hit to regain composure, all right? Let's talk, let's, let, let's, let's read a little bit from uh, the Tzemach Tzedek. The Tzemach Tzedek was the fourth Chabad Rebbe. Um, and he has a book called Derek Mitzvah which means the, uh, the, 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 the way of the mitzvah. And in it, he kind of gives us, it, it's a really cool book, actually. I, I, read most, I read almost the entire thing. Um, and the reason is because it was a very fascinating read. It's kind of these discourses, a different discourse, on each mitzvah, as many mitzvahs he was able to do. It's not all of them. It's probably like 50 of them or whatever it is. And what, what the discourse is, is basically, it's kind of as if somebody pulled back the screen and all of a sudden you got to see behind the scenes the mitzvah. He tries to give you an idea as to how this mitzvah operates on a spiritual level. What's happening spiritually speaking from this mitzvah. Okay? So let's see what he says about this topic. All right. It's a little long. Um, who are we holding here? Um, Margarita, are you with us? I don't know. Can see you, can hear you. Marguerite, you want to read for us a little bit? All right, I guess not. Okay, so we're back at the top of the lineup. Marilyn, sorry, no, I'm no, muted. No, I can read. Go ahead, Marilyn. So text number 11. One second, Marilyn, I muted you by mistake. You have to unmute yourself. No, I am unmuted, I can read. Oh, oh, Marguerite, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Marilyn, Marilyn, we'll get to you in just a moment. I apologize. Okay. So Marguerite, go ahead. Text 11. That one tactic to use in warfare is that one side will feel compelled to suffer some losses and even retreat. But really, it is all a clever ploy to buy time and get to a better place so that they can thereafter strike back forcefully and obliterate their position. Wow, that's exactly what's going on now. Had they not allowed themselves to suffer those initial losses, they wouldn't have been able to do anything later. It turns out that even at the moment, the enemy inflict losses and cuts off soldiers. It's really too, wait, I don't see any more. It's really too, I'm just gonna have to turn the page for you. It's really to the enemies. Me own the treatment, detriment, as they are facilitating their own obliteration later. The same is true in the analogy of our own religious warfare. This is the secret of exile. As our sages tell us, when the Jews were exiled to Edom, the Shekhinah, was exiled with them. Indeed, the Shekhinah is literally exiled, for she is forced to feed and invigorate negative forces. Oy. This is the true meaning of exile, namely the exile of the godly energy that animates evil and enables the violation of God's true desire. Now the Shekhinah endures great pain in this act of squeezing energy into a place that God hates, but in reality, it is all the extremely clever ploy Though this exile, we are able to extract the latent, latent energy left over from the shattering of the vessels that is vested in evil, thereby obliterating it completely. Wow! Thank you, Marguerite. Some very deep stuff. And if you weren't with with uh, if you weren't following with the text, let me try to clarify. Here's what happens. Why are we here in this world? We're here in this world in order to uplift sparks, right? To to, to elevate the world. Why, do, why does wine exist? In order that a Jew should be able to use it, make a bracha on it, and learn some Torah over it, or make Kiddush with it, or whatever. Say a for something good on it. Why does food exist? 
in order that we should be able to sustain ourselves, in order to be able to serve Hashem. Why does, I don't know, why, why, why does Zoom exist? Right. In order that nine Jews in Pasadena should be able to get together and learn Torah together, right? The, the, the problem, or really maybe the, 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 the way the game works, is that Hashem purposely makes everything also have another way that you can do it. Many of you were on a class that I gave, what was it, uh, two months ago, two and a half months ago, and there were other people who were trying to use Zoom for the exact opposite, opposite of holiness. Oh, yeah. Right? For those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, uh, about two and a half months ago, we were hacked in the middle of a Zoom class. We were discussing faith and trust in God, lofty, lofty things, 15, 20 people sitting and learning Torah, and some, what do they call them? Uh, 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 naysayers, or, or ne'er do gooders, right? That's the word. Uh, came on, and they had other plans, terrible plans. Uh, ter- obviously, things that came that, that, that got their, for, their their energy from the forces of klipa, from the forces of negativity. So, as we are trying to use Zoom for a positive thing, as we're trying to use this wine to make kiddush to make a bracha to use it for positive things, there are other people in this world, and I should say, not even other people, because sometimes it's the same person. Sometimes I use Zoom for a negative thing. Sometimes I use wine for a negative thing, right? So, or, or even if I don't, I definitely always have that potential to do so. To use it for something negative. I can use this wine and get drunk off it. I can use this Zoom to do terrible things over it. That is so the people did. When we do so, what do we do? We take our neshama, we take the godly energy which we were vested in it, which we were empowered with by, at birth, that our neshama ga- gives us every single moment of our existence. We take that energy and we squeeze it into a terrible, terrible place. Right? We take the whole thing like, like, like a genie, like a genie from Aladdin. We squeeze it and, and imprison it inside the lamp. And right? we take that energy and we force it to be part of some sort of negative action. And how terrible is that? Right? But like the analogy that the Tzemach Tzedek gives, sometimes that step back can be used for a step forward. In other words, just like when it comes to wine. We, what is the Jewish approach to wine? We look at it and we say, how can wine be used to serve Hashem? We look at Zoom and we say, how can Zoom be used to serve Hashem? Similarly, we have to look at sin. And we have to say, how can sin be used to serve Hashem? Now, before you start jumping all over me, <laughs> there's no way you could use a cheeseburger to serve Hashem. Shlomo, I'm not sanctioning in any way here that somebody should walk into McDonald's, eat a cheeseburger, and say, all right, I'm going to serve Hashem. Now I'm going to use the energy of this cheese. No, the Torah tells us clearly that that's not the way to serve Hashem. But what about if it happened to me? What about if in my past, maybe because I didn't know, maybe I ate a cheeseburger, I didn't know it was a cheeseburger. It's true, it's a mistake, but you know, whatever, I did it. So what do I do now? What do I do about that? that? Does the Torah not have a plan for this moment? No. Just like every other moment and every other scenario in life, the Torah has a plan for this moment too. You now have a unique potential. What do you have? You have a potential for teshuva. Teshuva is a very, very powerful form of connection with God. Teshuva means I get to serve God with kind of a, a, a longing, with a, with a regretting for not having been closer with him. What do they say? Distance makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah. Right? We should ne- now. So let me ask you a question. If distance makes the heart grow fonder, should I today divorce Kitty for a month in order that I should feel that distance, in order that I should be able to feel, feel a deeper love for her? We won't That's tell true. her. Heaven, for, heaven, <laughs> heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. But whenever we have a disagreement, that should lead, I should choose to take that kind of slight separation to use it to channel, our, to channel into our love, to have a deeper love for each other. Hopefully you all do the same in your relationships. In our relationship with Hashem, which is the ultimate marriage that we have, it works the same way. We should never choose to disobey Hashem. But if we ever find ourselves in a post facto moment where we already did it, we, we, we disobeyed the will of Hashem. Now, as a Jew, we are tasked with a new opportunity. What do I do about this regret and this longing that I have for Hashem? This regret that I have for something negative that I did, this longing that I have for Hashem. Now, I have to find a way to channel that into, into, into my new way of serving Hashem. As the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya. Okay? Let's see it. Text 12. Um, Marilyn, right? That's it. Marguerite just read. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Such is repentance out of love. It comes from the depths of the heart with great love and fervor. From a soul passionately desiring to cleave unto God, thirsting for God like parched desert soil. And as much as the soul has been in a barren wilderness and in the shadow of death, 
removed from the divine light, the soul now thirsts for God even more than the souls of the righteous. As our sages say, in the place where penitents stand, not even the perfectly righteous can stand. It is concerning the, re the repentance out of such great love that they have said that penitents premeditated sins become in his case like virtues since thereby he has attained his great love, this great love. Thank you, Marilyn. So remember that moment when we said that somebody who chooses to say, I'm going to sin now, but I'm going to repent later. So he managed to drag even the teshuva into him sinning. Yeah. Here's somebody who does the opposite. He says to himself, I'm now on my way to towards doing teshuva. I'm, I, I regret my past mistakes. But he's reached such a deep level of regret that he's now taken that sin, which was a sin. Don't get me wrong. The cheeseburger was a cheeseburger and it was against the will of Hashem. But he's taking that feeling, he's using that to channel, he's using that to fuel a powerful love for Hashem. That's some powerful stuff there. And that's why, what did we, what did we quote from the Talmud? In the place where penitence then, where someone who's doing Teshuvah is, that level of serving Hashem, even a tzaddik can't be there. You know why? Because a tzaddik doesn't have any such negative things in order to be able to use that to channel into, into, into a love for Hashem. This is on an emotional level, the altar of explained it. The Rebbe explains this even on a logical level, like uh, why this actually makes perfect sense. Arnold, you want to read for us? Text 13. Oh, I apologize. I muted you. I sometimes do that because I think I have to unmute everyone. And then I... Go ahead. In the light of what was previously discussed, we emerge with an understanding that the dips and falls persona personally and globally that are the product of a person's bad choices are also a part of the ultimate plan. Inasmuch as they are certainly in accordance with God's omnipotent awareness, they must be part of the goal. Now, the reality does change that the sin itself remains a violation of God's will. However, the negativity, the negative reality, the sin created, um, the negative reality the sin creates in the world and in the person is not a viol violation of God's will. Namely, it's, in tr it's true, it's, it isn't a true fall. Rather, it is a part of the climb that follows the flow from, uh, that flows from it. Thank you, Yosef Ilan. So this is a revolutionary outlook, right? And this could really fill a person with hope. This is much deeper than saying, oh, Hashem always loves you, will always welcome you back home. We know you sinned, but Hashem has a place for you, even if you sinned. This is saying you can take that experience, you can... It's up to, uh, in other words, this is giving us even more choice. This is saying, now that you've sinned, which was a choice that you made, you now have the choice. Are you going to let that sin own your life? Or are you going to own the sin and allow the sin or the, 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 the position which the sin put you in, which is a position of, 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 uh, of longing for Hashem? Of, uh, are you going to let that fuel an even, even deeper love for Hashem? This all of a sudden takes something which seemed meaningless, something which seemed purposeless, purposeless, and turns it into something meaningful and purposeful. It's not just something, all right, it was a bad thing, we're moving past it. We're not moving past it. We're taking it, we're moving through it. That's a powerful point. Let's drive it home. Calvin, you want him? 13B. A person should never despair or give up hope thinking that all is lost. Heaven forbid. It is much as the current negative situation is not only the product of your choice, but also part of God's master plan, it should lead you to repentance and even greater heights. It can and should enable you to, through repentance, reach back and sublimate even those sparks trapped in the nether of perjury. Yes, the sin is indeed a violation of God's will, and the only way to approach it is to disengage. However, when it comes to the personal situation created through sin, the person ought to know that his sin has created space for growth. Vested with the strength and promise that no one will ever be pushed away, he will certainly utilize that power. Sorry, go ahead. Transforming the energy trapped in evil to good, surpassing the good of even the holiest of the righteous. Thank you, Kalman. So, you know, they, it's a real cliche 
that life is like a, a journey along, we're traveling along a road or whatever. But it's very, very true. That road sometimes has its ups and sometimes has its downs. So it has hills and valleys and it has stumbling blocks and it has pits that we fall into, etc. Very often we say to ourselves, if you fall, don't worry, you'll pick yourself back up. I think if there's one lesson we, we're going to walk away with from, with, with from today's class, which means that as we travel along the path of life, of course we should always strive to do what we know is right. Right? But when we do fall, we should know that, yes, this is also part of the plan. Hashem didn't dictate how many times we're going to fall. It was certainly our own choice that made us fall. But this also is a part of Hashem's plan. Hashem wants regular people to love Him in regular ways. But Hashem also wants that when people fall, that should also be a way of loving Him. That should also fuel the love towards Him. That should also enhance the, the relationship with God. And that should also help with God's general plan for the world, which is uplifting the entire world to be a better place. So l'chaim, l'chaim. I'm, I'm almost half tempted to say l'chaim to failing. Of course, we would never say that. And I want to make, sure, make it absolutely clear that that's not the point of this lesson. So it, it's not a l'chaim to fail. We shouldn't fail. I wish you all that you should have smooth journeys along the way of the path of life as you travel along the path of life. And you shouldn't fail. You shouldn't fall. But if you do, or if you have, we should recognize that these shouldn't be things that eat us up, or even things we try to push away. We should make them, they're not a part of my life. They should be a part of my life, that we should own up to them. But much more than own up to them, we should, we should use them as catalysts in our serving of Hashem. We should use them to fuel a real and powerful relationship. And to, 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 to if we go down, that should help us to go further up. L'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim. Thank you, Zuzi. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight.